Welcome to Clear Eyes, Full Hearts, a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. This is an episode-by-episode episode look at the award-winning TV show Friday Night Lights by Peter Berg. I'm Stacey Oristano. I played Mindy Collette Riggins. And I'm Derek Phillips, and I play Billy Riggins. Our assumption is, as always, that you, the listeners, have already watched the show. But if you haven't already, go watch Friday Night Lights, which is currently streaming on Netflix and Peacock TV, because there will be spoilers in our podcast. And we have merch. That is right. <laughs> so go check out our brand new website designed by Eleanor Carez, who is at Eleanor Carez on Instagram. Our website is www.cleareyesfullheartspod.com. Once again, that's cleareyesfullheartspod.com. We still want to answer your questions. So email us what you want to know at cleareyesfullheartspod at gmail.com. Today, we are talking about season two, episode two, Bad Ideas. It was written by Liz Heldens and directed by Jeffrey Reiner. Here is the NBC synopsis. The start of school finds Tammy struggling to adjust to life with a newborn without help from Coach Taylor, while Matt and Landry have trouble adjusting to new lifestyles. We have a fantastic guest with us today, a dear friend and also a producer of this podcast, Steve Walters, who plays awkward guidance counselor Glenn Reed. <laughs> Who came up with the awkward guidance counselor? Steve, part? I bet Steve, I bet did. Steve did. <laughs> but before we chat with Steve, let's get into the highlights of this episode. Okay, so we're only two episodes in, and the wheels are already starting to come off with this TMU thing. It is not boding well for Coach and for Tammy. Everything seems a little chaotic. Things just don't seem right in Dylan without Coach being there. Maybe that's what it is. Everything is messed up with him yeah, gone. Yeah, everything's kind of out of whack. People are dying. People are getting murdered and left <laughs> and right. <laughs> people are breaking up. People are breaking up. Dylan, Texas, is in complete and total utter chaos without Coach to steer the ship. Because season two is so new to me, I've never watched any of it. It. I don't know. I mean, I know he comes back, but I don't know when he comes back. So like, do, do we have to sit in this yucky place for a really long time? Because I know, don't like it. To be honest with you, I can't remember exactly what episode he comes back. So yeah, I do <laughs> feel like we have to stew in this for a little bit though. Okay. I'll stew in it. I'll stew in the chaos. I do just say when we were watching the players at TMU, I have to assume this was a casting choice, but it was also brilliant. Those players look older and they look bigger than any of the high school kids that we've seen. Like they were adult men playing football. Well, here's two things that most people might not know about the football players on the show. So there were guys that they cast that they would let have their helmets off that were younger. Some of them didn't play football at all, but they were mm -hmm. like the faces of the football players. But the guys that they cast to play the football players you know, the guys who were actually doing the stunts and everything else, most of those guys were post-college age. They were never allowed to take their helmets off because they look like grown-ass men. Oh, like 30, 40-year-old men. Well, not 30, 40, but they were like 25, 26, 27. And even guys like Eric Smart, Kitch's stunt yeah. double, he never took his helmet off. He has a baby face, though. He, he does have. have a baby face, but a lot of those guys don't have baby faces. And so this was the first time that the guys who were the actual stunt doubles were actually like on the sidelines with their helmets off. Oh, wait, so we're are these the guys that we've actually been sort of seeing before, but now we see their faces? We've been seeing them do all the stunts on Friday Night Lights, but we haven't. So, so one of the guys, and I can't think of his name right off the top of my head right now, but he was one of the quarterbacks in the scene where the coach was mm -hmm. doing quarterback drills and you saw the guys dropping back. And I was like, oh, dude, that's that. And I can't think of his name, but yeah. Oh, wow. That's smart. Yeah. So a lot of those stunt doubles never had their helmets off because they look like men. And finally, they get to be like, Ma, you can see me in this yeah, episode. Yeah, I'm finally in this episode, a year and a half into it. Glenn is is here. Glenn, the apparently awkward guidance counselor. Here's what I thought watching Glenn in this first scene. He's taking on this position that he feels so unqualified for and it is stressful and anxiety inducing. And it seemed a little bit like how you and I felt when we were talking about starting a podcast. Yeah. It also felt a little bit how I felt when I was starting Friday Night Lights. It was this new thing. And I think I've told you guys on this podcast, my first scene on the show was Peter Berg asking me to improv something. And I just remember this cold trickle of sweat going down my armpit. And I was like, oh man, like I, no one's ever asked me to improv something, especially like a first day on set. So they always say as an actor, bring whatever you got, bring it to the role. If you're feeling angry, bring mm -hmm. it. If you're feeling nervous, bring it. We're going to have Steve on a little bit later. And I'd like to ask what he was thinking and feeling in those moments, his first moments on the show. He's working with Connie Britton. That's got to be a little nerve wracking. 
nerve-wracking. If that was my first day on set, especially this being my first show and it was with Connie, I would shake. At least yeah. my first was with you. <laughs> hey, what's that supposed to mean? No, you made me feel comfortable. It's a well, compliment, dum dum. So the next scene we see on the show is Grandma Saracen with her tiara. And it's, I mean, Luann Stevens just... She's so good. But she says, you can't put a price tag on happiness as she's walking around with this tiara that she bought, I'm assuming online, and God knows- $2,400. Is that what it was? $2,400. Oh, Lord. Like, what is that thing actually made out of? I started to cry a little bit when she put the tiara on because it's like with the dementia and the Alzheimer's and there's like a regression that happens to who you were when you were a child. And I was like seeing baby grandma for a minute and that made me tear up. And that's the thing that Luann does so well well on this show, honestly, is like you have these moments where you're laughing because it's a funny scene, but it's also just like tugs at the heartstrings. It's like you're laughing and crying at the same time. She's so good. And if you guys don't follow her on Instagram, I don't know exactly what it's Mama Lou, I believe. But like, yeah, so. you got to follow her on Instagram because some of the stuff she She's posts adorable. just has me cracking up. She just posted something about the Super Bowl because she did a commercial with Troy Palomalu, the Steelers football player. And she said something like, dig it, guys. <laughs> like, oh, gosh. Just cracks me oh, up. man. Okay. It seems to me that Buddy is getting shoved out of his role as like the king of the Panthers or the booster club or whatever. Yeah, this new coach has come in and he wants to change things up a little bit. And so they don't necessarily want to be using Buddy Garrity Motors anymore is the backdrop for their parties at Dillon. So there's a new booster that's in town and he's a little more popular with the new coach. The coach says to Buddy, sure hope you can make it. Oof, not good. So Landry's dad shows up to football practice. And I had these flashbacks to when your dad showed up to watch Tim or when Matt's dad was in town and he showed up on the sidelines. What is it, Derek, specifically about having a father on the sideline that there's so much tension there? No, I think what they're really striking at is that core thing that I think every young man feels, which is that desire to have your dad be proud of you. And I think that that's at the core of what that is. But then on top of it, you got a lot of dads in this town. Landry's dad actually turns out to be a decent guy. There's a lot of dads in this town, though, that you're never going to make those dudes happy. You're never going to make those guys proud of you. So there's a little bit of that, but it's hard to watch because part of the problem is that Landry weighs about a buck 60 and they've got him playing defensive end, which is really not a good place for a guy who weighs 160 pounds. So he's just getting lit up every single time that they run a draw play or anytime that they're running up the gut and Riggins is out there blocking and just knocking him on his ass. But yeah, it's hard to watch. (laughs) It's hard to watch. It's hard for me to watch too, because I was a a little guy on a football field when I was growing up and I spent a lot of time on my backside. (laughs) So we find that Jason's still has a hope or a spark inside of him that he might be able to walk one day. I honestly didn't know that this was a thought in his head, that he hadn't rendered himself to the fact that he's wheelchair bound for the rest of his life. I struggle with, is this actual optimism or is it like youthful ignorance? And I can't tell. And it breaks my heart a little bit. When they start talking about experimental surgery, I just want to scream. Nope, 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 nope. Nope. We'll see that later in this episode too. Buddy Garrity has a line where he says, I've never lost. There's that warrior spirit that a person like Jason Street has, and he's never lost before. And this is the first loss. This is the first time in his life that he hasn't been able to will his way past a struggle. That's just got to be a tough thing to deal with. Look, I'm all about positivity and manifesting things, but this is something I don't think you can manifest your way out of. On a side note, I think the listeners of this show would be kind of interested to find out. So there's a guy that he bumps into as he's leaving the facility Mm -hmm. after he's talked to the doctor about this experimental surgery. And that person is Mark Zupan. Actually, it wasn't the doctor he was talking to about the experimental surgery. It's Mark Zupan Mm -hmm. that he bumps into that talks about the experimental surgery. But Zupan is the guy that we've talked about before who was in the documentary Murder Ball. He's also the captain of the U.S. wheelchair rugby team. And he's a gold medalist in the 2008 Summer Paralympics. He was the guy that Herc is very, very loose loosely based on, Zupan's a badass and he's a tough dude. And if you go back and rewatch it, you look how big that guy's arms are. Huge. Yeah. He is jacked. They flash by him just for a second. And I was like, Herc looks different. And then he's like, oh wait, that's not, that's not Herc. I didn't know it was Mark Zupan though. That's so, so cool. And that's the guy, as we said before, that's who Herc was very loosely based on, but also on top of it, it's who Kevin Rankin hung out with and Mm -hmm. trained with and learned what it was like to be in a chair from. I think that was the first time he might have been on camera for the show. It's very cool. Also watch Murder Ball if you have not. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's a really cool documentary. 
Carlotta, she's here. Season two is just coming in with a bang with all these new characters. They're just like throwing them in our face. Yeah. I kind of super dig this energy she's bringing into the Saracen house. It needs some control and some order and she's just making things happen. I'll tell you what, there's worse things in life than having a super hot Daniela Alonso moving in with you. I mean... Not too shabby for a high school there kid. There are worse things that could happen. <laughs> but yeah, she is. She's bringing some order because it's a very chaotic household at this point mm-hmm. in time, especially with Matt's dad gone again. So hopefully things will work out. We'll see what happens. We will see what happens because again, I have no clue. Okay. Antoine Beltrain is here in the house. I <laughs> love him giving it to coach. This is Mitchell Lance Adams, who I find again, so perfectly cast in this part. And when he says they should be paying me anyway, I bring a million dollars to the school. I was like, Hey, you know what? I agree with you. Well, interestingly enough, Stacy, so did the Supreme Court of the United States. This is kind of, it's not super topical because we are a podcast, but this this is literally within like the past year that the yeah. Supreme Court declared that the NCAA and that athletes in the NCAA have the right to earn money off their likeness. And regardless of where you sit on this issue, it has massively changed college football forever. And the money that they bring into those schools that before oh, yeah. they would never see a penny of and the work that they do and the schools would use their likeness anyway, it seemed so unfair to me. Billions of dollars. Billions. Yeah, Billions. I, I love this. I think it's the right move. Also him riding in that car. So he says to coach, what are you doing in the car with me when you have a new baby? And I was like, you know what? Yeah, coach, what are you doing? <laughs> Give coach a break. All right. Nope. He's trying his best, nope. Stacey. No, nope. no more Glenn. More Steve Walters. Tammy says it's not her first rodeo. And then Glenn, it's hard for me to refer to him as Glenn and not Steve. Glenn says, frankly, you frighten me a little bit. I think I might love Glenn. It's hard for me not to refer to him as Glenn because that's Glenn. what Brad Leland always called me and said, hey, Glenn, how's Glenn doing? <laughs> hey, Derek, have you talked to Glenn in a while? <laughs> Actually, has he? He still calls him Glenn 15 years after the show. But this is a great scene with Steve. I really was digging it. We're going to have Steve on, obviously, as we said Mm -hmm. later in this episode. But those first episodes of every season, it was boiling hot because we were usually shooting those in like August or September in Texas. So, I mean, there were days, I I remember specifically, there was a day where there were some players' cleats that were sticking to the field turf because it got so hot. I mean, we had days where the temperature was 112 degrees outside Mm -hmm. and 120 on the field. Dude, it didn't get much better at night. Nope, not in Texas. Lots of those sweaty nights at bars sweaty just nights. leaking through linen shirts. It was... <laughs> mm-hmm. With, and you try to find a bar that has the misters outside yes. so you can at least get a little bit of cold yes. water. I don't know why I was always under the impression of, oh, it's going to cool down at night. But like when Tammy came no. walking to that office covered in sweat, I think they sprayed some of it on her, but you didn't really have to do much of that. I mean, there were days when we were out on the football field and I'm a sweater where I was just <laughs> pouring through. They would bring these things called a worm, which is a big, huge AC unit. And it had a massive tube on it that was like the size of, you could crawl inside of it. Mm-hmm. And there were times where it was so hot, I'd like run in and like crawl into the worm and just lay down in the worm to get cool. Those things always scare me because I think they're just blowing a bunch of bacteria around. And so I try to stay away from them. You're a person that probably needs more bacteria in your life. You're sick I all the do. time. I need to go lick some dirt. Yeah, you need to go lick some dirt. <laughs> I'm going to send you some toilet seats. You can go lick some toilet seats. I'll go sit in a worm. It's fine. <laughs> I'm going to send you a worm and some toilet seats. Also in that scene where Connie is walking Gracie Bell in the stroller to go see Glenn. She didn't have a lick of makeup on and that sweat rolling down her face. And she's still so stunning. It was like, I actually got a little angry. She's attractive. No makeup on TV. And you and I have talked about this as well, Stacey. I don't know if we've talked about it on the show, but I mean, all these people are so much better looking in real life too. Like this show doesn't do anyone any favors in terms of the way that it's shot. Connie and I talked about this too, like the lighting and the effects, the makeup and everything that we did, they weren't ever used to make any of us look better. No, it was made to look natural and made to look real and gritty. Some of our cases, like me, a little rough. I always look rough on this show. I'm far better looking in real life. Trust me. <laughs> okay. I've got this really cool mustache right now that Stacy and everyone else Oh, you guys. Loves. And it just gets a little bit fuller every week. I love it. It has a life of its own. Talk about worms. Jeez. Come on. Okay, Landry. Landry gets a rally girl. And he asks that rally girl, do you think all human beings are capable of evil? And it seems to me Landry might not be handling this very well. Seems like right now Tyra is handling the murder a lot, a lot better than Landry is. Yeah. But good on our writers for giving these two these scenes because they're really God. crushing them. And that's also why Jesse Plemons 
ha, 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 is nominated for an Oscar right now. So we just found that out last week. How cool is it to say Oscar nominee Jesse Plemons? Oh, God, it sounds so good. I love it. And I'm pumped for him. And I mean, the guy is 100% deserving. He's just been turning in great work for the last 20 years. Dead honest, if you had asked me when we were shooting who would be the first Oscar nominee, I think I would have said Jesse Plemons. You know what's funny is I only got to have one scene with Jesse during the course of the show. And it was while we were doing like a rodeo scene. And this is like maybe season three or four. And it was just one scene where we got to interact with each other. And I was like, dude, this guy's really good. Working with him is great. Talented freaking guy. Oscar nominee Jesse Plemons. He might be the first, but I don't think he will be the last. Oh God, I don't think so either. I think I would have said Kyle and Jesse as my two first 15 years ago. We'll see. Is this the first time that we see that Matt is an artist? It's never talked about before, right? I don't think it's the first time because Street does mention, and I want to say it's like in the second episode, he mentions something about him being an artist and it's very, very early on. Well, we finally see he actually is incredibly talented. That picture was beautiful. Carlotta just digging through his stuff and then finds the magazines. Oh God. Okay, it happened. Julie and Matt break up. Yeah. I just, I feel like Matt needs a break, man. This kid is going through so much. Needs a break. He's got a gorgeous nurse living in his house. What more do you want? Don't you think that in and of itself could be so awkward though? I think it's going to end well in the long run. You know, remember we were having this conversation about how these kids kind of needed to sow, or well, Julie had to sow her wild oats. And she did it because she kind of made out with the Swede. And now I think, yeah, I think we're going to see Matt go in that direction. Spoiler alert. I bet that is not in Carlotta's contract that she signed. (laughs) I would be interested to see about that. Drunk, sweaty buddy is now one of my favorite buddies. Brad is very good at drunk acting. A lot of people will overdo acting drunk. Brad was spot on. No, he was great in that scene. He says, I never lost in my life, Rigo. They call him Rigo. I loved Rigo. It just punches me in the gut because that's what's happening here. This guy is losing. He's lost a lot. Lost his wife. He's lost his family. He's lost his home. His best friends in another town. And now he's losing the Panthers. Ooh. Yeah. Everything's being taken away from him. But that's what this show does so well. I get the drunkenness of it when you look at it like that. Tyra and Landry, this this last scene, the scene that closes out the episode, there's something that I was thinking about. The writers now know these actors so well and the writers knowing that they could entrust this kind of material to these two very young actors speaks volumes to me. Jesse and Annie are just knocking this stuff out of the park. It's so damn good. And that's why you gotta watch season two. Look, I understand people don't love the murder story. I'm not a huge fan of it myself. But as I said before, one of the things that makes it not just watchable, but intriguing is watching these two. These two just are crushing these scenes. But even though I'm not a fan of the storyline, it's like every week they bring it. I mean, the whole entire season they do. Anyway, guys, that is it for our wrap-up portion of the show. Now we're moving on to our interview with Steve Walters, a.k.a. Glenn Reed. The awkward Steve Walters. The awkward (laughs) Steve Walters. Who's not that awkward in real life? Or is he? Come find out. everybody. I'm here with one of my best friends on the planet, Stephen Walters, who plays guidance counselor slash science teacher extraordinaire Glenn Reed on the show. Steve is not only an actor, but a writer, producer, and director in various forms of media, including theater, film, television, and podcasts. As an actor, he's been seen on such shows and films as Prison Break, Trauma, My Generation, Chase, The Jogger, Dallas, and Dirty John. Steven is an emeritus member of the resident company at the Tony Award-winning Dallas Theater Center, in addition to being a co-founder of Second Thought Theater in Dallas, Texas. As a screenwriter and producer, Steve's films have played at South by Southwest, Dallas International Film Festival, and the London International Film Festival, among many others. Steve is a co-writer and producer on the hit comedy, The Bounce Back, directed by Brian Poyser, which premiered at South by Southwest and was distributed by Tribeca Films under the title Love and Air Sex, New York Times Critics Pick. He is also the executive producer, co-creator, and head writer of 1865, The Audio Drama, which the AV Club recently called the best audio drama of all time. Steve serves as the chief content officer for Airship FM, and he is the producer of this here podcast. So, Steve, Mm -hmm. welcome to the show that you produce. (laughs) Welcome to your show. (laughs) I know that the reason that you're sick, I hear it in your voice, is because we were just at an amazing wedding in Palm Springs. 
We were, yes. And this is why I've got, can everyone tell that my nose is stopped up? It's a little, uh, you can tell. It's not not COVID. COVID. It's not COVID. You sound good, all things considered, because I know that you were working in Hawaii and you flew Mm -hmm. in late at night and you didn't sleep. And then we were out by the pool all day long, dancing and listening to awesome music and celebrating our friend's wedding. So you sound really great, all things considered. This is all very true. On top of it, I've got a bacteria collecting dust broom for a mustache. Mm -hmm. Right over your lip. Yeah. It's a Petri dish on top of your lip. <laughs> okay. You, you, we get it. We don't have to keep going with the mustache. <laughs> you do look a little bit like an adult film star from the 1970s. Oh, come the, on, man. In the best possible way. The best possible, <laughs> the best way. possible way. <laughs> All right. I'm done with this interview. Uh, <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on the show, Steve, coming on your show. I think our listeners might be interested in knowing a little bit about how you and I met because I've known you long before FNL, the TV show, was even a thought in anyone's mind. Do you remember the first time we met? Yes, we met, I want to say it was 1999 at Meet the Majors at Baylor University. Oh, no. Yeah, let me give some background on this. I think this is when we first met, Derek. Meet the Majors was a sort of recruitment program at Baylor University's theater departments where prospective students would come in, they would spend a weekend with some of the majors and you would get to meet them and get to experience what it was like to be a theater student at Baylor. And Derek is one of the first people I met. And the reason I met him is because he was playing Hamlet at Baylor. And so I got to see Derek in that role. I thought he was an incredible actor. Derek knows this, but he is one of the reasons that I went to Baylor because I thought that that show was so incredible. But we got to get to know each other a little bit too. And We remained friends over the years. And then after college, Derek and I co-founded a theater company together in Dallas, Texas called Second Thought Theater, which we worked at together for how long, Dee? Like five years, I think? I was only a part of Second Thought for three and a half years. Well, I mean, I guess I'm still a part of Second Thought technically, but like boots on the ground, getting deep in the trenches. I was only there for three years because Friday Night Lights came along and and it really made it almost impossible for me to do both. Yeah, that's right. Because I think probably three or four years into it, you were splitting time between Austin and Dallas. And then probably a few months after that, you were on your way to LA. Second Thought is a theater company in Dallas, Texas. It's professional theater. We have an agreement with Actors Equity, which is the stage union. And that theater is still going strong. I mean, I went to it and and there's a lot of alumni from Second Thought, like Derek, who've gone on to have really incredible TV careers, but also Allison Tolman from Fargo. And Stacy sort of has a tangential connection to Second Thought as well. Well, that's how I met the both of you is through Second Thought because we all worked in the same building. Yeah, that's right. But it's cool. It's still alive today. The legacy of this thing that we all started lives yeah. on well beyond our involvement in it. So it's Joey Oglesby, cool. who was also on Friday Night Lights, and we'll have him on the show later. He was also a part of Second Thought Theater. Will Harper. Yeah, he plays Chitty on The Good Place. He's the lead in season two of Love Life on yeah. HBO, and he's got a myriad of projects that are rolling out. Coming and out. He's also been on 1865, Steve's podcast that we talked about when we uh, just introduced Steve. It's funny, man, because I do remember those times going and driving down to Austin, Texas, working on Friday Night Lights, and then coming back into town and immediately being handed a paintbrush and like painting Mm -hmm. a stage or building sets. It was a lot, man, to try and balance that at first. And then eventually it just became so much. I was like, guys, I, I just can't do both anymore. My best recollection of you is when I met you in New York. Like I had a bunch of friends from Baylor Theater that came and stayed at my place because they were going to do summer stock in various parts of the Northeast. And so they stayed with me in New York and there were like four or five people that stayed in my apartment this one time. And I just remember Steve and I just having a great time. And I was like, I like this guy a lot. I guess I remember you from Meet the Majors, but I really remember like thinking I'm going to probably be friends with this guy. Yeah, because I think at Meet the Majors, I was one of an army of people. Whereas like when we went up to New York, there was just a small group group of us hanging out. You know, it's kind of crazy to think about though, in a way, like Second Thought is part of at least my Friday Night Lights journey. Because by the time I got to the point where I was auditioning for that show, you were already well into it. You probably shot at least a dozen episodes by the time I auditioned for the first time. And because of Derek, Jeffrey Reiner, who was the sort of resident producing show running director, I guess you could call him. I don't exactly know what Jeffrey's title was, but I mean, Jeffrey knew what Second Thought Theater was. And so if he saw Second Thought Theater on a resume, he kind of perked up. And I remember at my first audition for a role that I did not get. You auditioned before Glenn for an Oh, yeah. Yeah. I auditioned for FNL at least a half dozen times, maybe more. Oh, I yeah. remember specifically one of the roles that you auditioned for is the guy who beats the crap out of Tim in the bar. Yeah. Steve, oh. for those of you who don't know, Steve is like, how tall do you see? Six, four, six, five? Yeah, six, four. 
Yeah. yeah. So Steve's like six foot four and he auditioned to be the guy that beats the crap out of Tim at the bar when he and dad have a, a fight. And I think that yeah. might have been in episode 17 of the first season. Yeah. Actually, like because of my size, I mean, Lynn is obviously a very awkward, nerdy character. And that's a little bit closer to Steve in real life. Yeah. Like I auditioned for all these big, burly, muscle meathead guys. The idea that I would be able to beat up Tim Riggins is an absurdity. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like that's, that's just absolutely be never going to happen. They kept bringing me back though. And I think in the early days, I would get in the room because of my size, right? They were yeah. looking for big guys and they'd see my specs. They'd be like, oh, this guy's 6'4", 210. Let's get him in here. He's probably a big dude. But the thing is like, I'm all legs. Like I'm a little bit top heavy. So I'm just kind of awkward looking. And so they would get me in the room and they'd be like, nah, he's not right for this. And I remember during like one audition, Jeffrey was, I think it was my second or third time going in. He, he knew who I was at this point. And I could tell that he liked me and I could tell that he wanted me on the show, but he wasn't quite sure what to do with me. And he put me through the paces. I mean, he was like, throw the script down, toss it aside. Let's get into it. I think it was this role that you're talking about there. It was sometime you know, in the back half of season one. We got into it. I mean, I got up in Jeffrey's face. He got up in my face. We were screaming at each other. The local casting director, Beth Supko, was involved. She was screaming at me. I was screaming at her. I mean, we, we oh went God. in. I mean, we went all in on this scene yelling and cursing. I mean, it went pretty well. I mean, I let loose, you know, I, I really yeah. got into it. But at the end of it, Jeffrey looked at me and he goes, he's like, my man, you second thought kids, you, get, you, get, you guys know what you're doing. You know how to act. And I was like, oh, thanks, man. Thank you. He goes, I got to tell you, Steve, you don't have a mean bone in your body. No. And I was like, no, I really don't. I really don't. He's like, he's like, this isn't your role. This isn't your role. And I was like, no, it's definitely not. I remember leaving that audition and he said something to me to the effect of like, we're going to find you something. We're going to find something for you. And so I believed that I would eventually get on. I just didn't know what it would be, what that would look like or anything of the sort. It seems to me that the part of Glenn was written for you. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's so yummy, Steve material. I'm going to interject here. Steve and I were roommates. Meanwhile, just <laughs> FYI, guys, like when I got Friday Night Lights, Steve Walters was my roommate. Steve Walters and I had been roommates at this point in time, I think probably three years. Yeah. I moved out to LA after the first season of Friday Night Lights. And I remember Steve calling me and being like, hey, man, I just got this audition for Friday Night Lights for the second season. The character's name is Glenn Reed. Do you know anything about it? And I was like, I don't know anything about it, but let's read through it. And I remember you and I reading through it over the phone. And I remember getting off the phone with you and going, Steve, you're going to book this. Yeah, it's yours. Like, this is your yeah. job. And that wasn't like to put added pressure on you. If anything, it was just like, I mean, who's going to play this better than you? <laughs> I'm serious. Like you crushed yes, see, it I agree. right through it. Well, thanks. Thanks, you guys. I mean, I'll tell you, like, I've heard all sorts of rumors about Glenn, about how the character came to be. I, what I know for sure is, is that I was not supposed to play that role. Like, this could be a rumor. I have no way of knowing if this is true. And I've never asked anyone. But what I heard was, is that I heard this story that early on, Connie and Kyle decided that they wanted their character's marriage on the show to be portrayed in a certain way. And that one of the deal breakers for the two of them was infidelity. Yes. And that they just didn't want to go there. They thought it was cliche and they wanted to actually just make the artistic choice to say like, look, we want them to be in a faithful marriage. I think that part's true. I actually think I've heard Connie and Kyle talk about that. It that is part is definitely true. I know That's that true. for a fact. The rumors that I heard as it relates to Glenn is that originally that they were trying to cast like a classic Hollywood young leading man type, that he was like meant to be super good looking and that it kind of was like, I mean, obviously you can tell from the story almost from the get go that it's almost flirting with the line of that in a way on the page at least. And if you have like a really good looking guy in the part, then perhaps like it could be a threat, right? What I heard, and I don't know if it's true, when we get Connie on, we'll have to ask her. I never did. But what I heard was is that they basically came back and they said, listen, we don't like this Glenn storyline. We don't want some good looking leading man who's really trying to hit on Connie. We don't want somebody who's really a threat to Coach Taylor. And so they went in the complete opposite direction and they started looking for someone who was a little bit nerdier, a little bit less threatening, a little bit more nebbishy. And that's where I came in. So I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's a rumor. It's something that I heard through the grapevine and that I've never confirmed. Whatever the truth is, at the end of the day, I think that they were looking for somebody that could bring some comedy to it, somebody that could be non-threatening, somebody that could be a little bit more of a puppy dog with her. And so it worked out to my benefit. 
That's interesting, man. I never thought about it that way. I mean, you could be right, but definitely when we have Connie on the show, we need to ask her about that. So what was your audition process like for Glenn Reed? I mean, at that point, I had been in so many times that it was old hat. I knew not to get too comfortable with the words on the page. Like I knew to be ready, to be loose, you know, to throw it aside. And so that's what we did. We just improvised. I think we did the kitchen scene. Actually, we did a scene that ended up not being in it. It was a scene where I ended up doing the dishes for her for some reason. And I just remember Jeffrey was basically playing the part of Tammy Taylor and he just kept going and kept going. I mean, I think we went on for, I mean, it felt like it lasted for at least 10 minutes. Yeah. I mean, who, who knows how long we improv, but we just kept going and he kept escalating the scene and he kept building upon the awkwardness. And basically he started barking orders at me that were more and more absurd. And I would just do it, whatever he said to do, as if he was Tammy, I would just say, yes, okay. And I mean, I had some background in improv. I had some background as like an improv comic. I was in a comedy troupe and I knew a little bit of the fundamentals of yes and. And I sort of relied on that in that moment to just keep going. And no matter how ridiculous and absurd it got, I just kept going. For our listeners at home, like one of the rules of improv is yes and. The first so you, rule. Yeah. The first rule of improv is basically to accept whatever that person is giving you and then expound on it, right? Yeah. I mean, it was an awesome audition and I felt good. I mean, I remembered what you had said, Derek. I mean, I, re- I had confidence going in and I was like, maybe I am right for this part, but you never know. But you guys know, I mean, you read a part, you think you're perfect for it, but you never know. Even if you crush it in the room, you walk out yeah. and it's like, well, I'm probably never going to hear from them again. So yeah. out of our hands. Listen, in the same vein of being kind of awkward and nerdy, will you please go full detail into your story of the day before shooting? Oh, God. Uh, it's my it, favorite. <laughs> it's, it is the worst story of all time. But yes, I will tell it. The worst first day on a set I've ever heard of in my whole entire life. Yeah, but I would say so. It's awful. So I get into town. I get into office. Austin the night before, really late. I think I arrived at like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I had to shoot. I had a call time like 6 a.m. I was staying at that hotel downtown that they put us up. And I think it was like the residence inn or something like that. I can't remember. But I was starving, but I didn't want to eat because I didn't want to have an upset stomach in my first day of shooting. So I, I walked down to the corner store to get a cliff bar. And I'm just like eating a cliff bar, just walking around on 6th Street on my way back to the hotel, listening to music. When I get to the hotel room, I go to brush my teeth after having finished my cliff bar. And I look up and half of my front tooth is missing. And you just didn't notice it before. No, because half of my front tooth is fake. It's like a cap, right? Mm -hmm. So it's an artificial thing that's on there. And it was just gone. It was missing. And I guess I swallowed it when I was eating the Cliff Bar. Cliff Bars are super chewy, right? They're chewy. Chewy, but also a little chunky. So a yeah, little... you can definitely swallow a tooth and not notice it. And so of course I'm thinking, I'm going to get fired. They're going to fire me. I can't be walking in there with a snaggle tooth on my first day of shooting. <laughs> what do I do? So I think I called my mother. I don't think I knew what else to do. I think I called her. I was like, mom, what do I do? And she's like, there's 24 hour dentists. And I was like, see, this is some, this is why you call your mom. Because I didn't know that there was such a thing as a 24 hour dentist. So I start calling these dentist offices like crazy. I mean, I start leaving voicemails of dentist offices all over Austin. Finally, one of them calls me back at like four o'clock in the morning, right? But you gotta understand, I've been up all night pacing around, like I'm gonna get fired. I'm gonna get fired. So then I make it into the dentist office. They put an artificial implant cap on my front tooth. And I like make it to set at like 5.59. You know what I mean? And like, I would never want to do that on my first day. I'd want to be 30 minutes early. I'd want to be walking in, whatever. I get there and like, I mean, I'm basically second scene up that day. And so they're like, go to your trailer. We got some paperwork for you. You know, and I'm just like in there and I'm just like, oh, thank God. I think I did like a quick fitting in wardrobe. I went back to the trailer. I'm like hanging out in the trailer and I used to smoke back then. And I walk outside of the trailer and I'm smoking this cigarette. I'm just like sober lead. And I'm talking to this guy. And I, and I happen to notice that me and this guy are wearing, we're both wearing a purple shirt. I just remember that. Like, I don't know why I remember it, but he's wearing a purple shirt. I'm wearing a purple shirt. And in the middle of us sharing this cigarette, I'm just panicked. I'm just like, I'm sweaty. I mean, all that sweat in that first episode, it's all real because I didn't sleep the night before. We basically shot it all out in one day. This producer walks up to me in the middle of sharing this cigarette with this guy. And he's like, hey, uh, listen. I want you to know that uh, everyone loves you. And this is how he starts. He doesn't tell me anything else. He just goes, everyone loves you. We're going to get you back on the show. And I'm like, get, get me back on the... I haven't got on the show yet. It's my first day. What's going on? He's like, so listen, I'm going to need you to clean out your trailer and I'm going to need you to come with me. And I'm like, well, what, what, what's going on? And he's like, there's a problem with your paperwork. Just come with me. I'm going to escort you back to the van. We're going to, we're going to take you back to your vehicle. Just call your agent and uh, they'll explain everything to you. So then I got to walk down. I'm I'm being fired. And that's what's happening. I'm being fired. I'm being escorted off the premises. I have to do the walk of shame down the middle of like where all the, you know, the three bangers are, Derek, you know, all the trailers where it's basically 
basically our base camp. I'm walking down the middle of this thing. And everybody's looking at me. People I just met, like I just met Annie Palicki and she's looking at me and she, she kind of mouths to me what's going on. And I just like, like with a tear in my eye, I'm like, I don't know. And I'm about to get in the van to be driven away. And then this PA comes running around the corner. And if it was a movie, they'd be running in slow motion. And the PA is like, wait, you fired the wrong guy. So the story is, is that the producer walked around the corner and another producer goes, well, which one am I supposed to fire? And the producer looks at me and this other guy standing there and goes, it's the one in the purple shirt. And then just walked away, but didn't specify which one in the purple shirt. My theory is, is that that other actor was better looking than me. And they were like, let's get rid of that guy. We should fire the ugly one. <laughs> I think the other guy was an extra, right? Or, or like a... Uh, maybe he was a featured extra, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it might have been. I'm not 100% sure. But so they're like, you fired the wrong guy. But now you got to understand, I've taken off my costume. I'm second scene of the day. So now they're, they're like, get back into makeup. We got to get you in makeup. We got to get your costume on. Ugh. We got to get you to set because you're up. You're shooting. You're shooting right now, right? So I go into the makeup trailer and I am freaking out. I am panicking. And there are two people in the makeup trailer who, who are doing what's called basically last looks. I mean, I guess it's not technically last looks, but they're in full costume, full makeup, full hair. It's Annie Palicki and Connie Britt, right? I had met Annie very briefly early that morning when I got to set, I'd never met Connie or senior except for on the show. I start telling them the story that I just told you. Okay. They get me in my makeup. I've got my costume on and I've got a little bit of a five o'clock shadow. Right. And they're like, you know what, before we finish up your makeup, you need to go shave that. So I go walk, I walk past Annie, I walk past Connie and I go to a sink in this trailer, this makeup trailer. And it's got this circular sort of faucet head and I've never seen anything like it. I'm just so tired and I'm so stressed out. And I'm talking to Connie and Annie and telling them the story about how I just almost got fired. And I turn the knob to this little faucet and the water shoots out. It shoots up in the air. And it's one of these sinks that you're supposed to put, you put your face in it and it cleans your makeup Well, it's off. a sink for like a hairdresser. If you've ever had your hair washed in a hair salon, that's what kind of sink it is. Because they have one of those hoses that comes and sprays the back of your head so you can lay down in the sink. Yeah, that's the, it. The nozzle's facing out. And so Steve turned it on. And it <laughs> yeah, so the water flies up into the air and then just splashes on top of Annie Palicki and Connie Britton. I mean, just completely <laughs> douses them. It gets their hair wet. Their makeup is wet. Their mm -hmm. costumes are wet. Mm -hmm. Their makeup is running. They are laughing hysterically. And I just keep repeating over and over and over. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. You're so pretty. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're so pretty. And like, thank God it was Andy and Connie because they are the sweetest women on the planet and they let me off easy and I think loved me from that moment forward. It was the worst day of my life. Also the most Glenn day. Yeah. Yes, this is why they cast me in that role because this is the type of stuff that happens to me as I move through the world. What was it like after that than having to go work with Connie? Oh, it was great. It was yeah. absolutely great. We, the first scene that we shot was the last scene of the episode. So it was the one in the hospital. But it's interesting. It's like looking back on it now, I see how how green I was. I'd mainly been a theater actor up to that point. I think I'd done one day on prison break prior to that. But there's a mistake. I don't know. Did you catch the mistake? No. Well, I see the baby. Steve Walters, as Glenn, sees the baby for the first time in that scene as we're walking out of the room. And I say, gosh, that's a beautiful baby. And I say it like it's the first time I've seen the baby, but it's not. I met the uh, baby earlier in the episode and we were shooting it, of course, out of order. It's fine. It like it doesn't. Well, it doesn't... maybe you thought the baby was really ugly before. No, and then the you babies changed your mind. So, the babies were super cute. They were the cutest babies. No, but honestly, it. I mean, in spite of the ways that you, of course, critique yourself and judge yourself and all those things, it was an incredible day. It was an incredible experience being on the show and working with Connie was for me the best part of it. I mean, she's fearless in the way that she attacks the text and the way that she improvises and the choices that she makes. I, I remember there was one day, I'm pretty sure it was in the second season, where I was was also on set and you were on set and I were on set at the same time. And it, I mean, this was just so much fun for us. Yeah. So we have this history together. And you were like, hey, man, I'm about to go shoot my scene. And I just wrapped out on my stuff. And I was like, I'm going to come to set with you. I want to watch your scene. So I came to set with you and I was watching a scene. I can't remember exactly what was going on, but there was some moment where you were opening up the ice box and you were putting like an ice tray in there or something like that. And I don't yeah. know if you fumbled for the ice tray. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember like after the first take, I was like, dude, that was hysterical. Do it again. And Connie came around the corner and she goes, are you directing him? And I went, what? <laughs> 
He goes, are you directing him? And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm just saying that I thought it was, I'm going to shut up now. Why was I even saying that? But it was like a friend is a friend, you know? Well, I mean? like, and we're friends and we work together. We've done yes. so many plays together at that point that yeah. that's the kind of like secondhand mm -hmm. relationship that we had where it was just like, we would give each other notes like that. Yeah. You know? And I was like, what am I doing actually? And I, I need to shut up. This is not my job to tell you what to do. <laughs> and I wasn't trying to tell you what to do. I just thought it was a funny moment. It's I was like, positive that, affirmation. That. Yeah, that's yeah. all. Connie came after me a little bit. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, but the whole thing was so special because, I mean, Stacy and I are also really good friends and have been friends now for almost 20 years. And I mean, it was yeah. great for us to get to be on set together and explore Austin together and do all those fun things. It was amazing. Yeah. And our buddy Joey got on there right around the same time as you. Mm -hmm. Well, he'll talk about yes. this. Yeah, he was the gas yeah. station attendant. But yeah. he came then he back. he comes back in episode eight, I think, of it. It may be a little bit earlier than that. He was down there probably two weeks into me because I was down there for like two months for the first stretch. And I think you really? Yeah, yeah. They had me on hold a lot. They weren't sure where I was going to go. Nice. But then, yeah, Joey came down and so all of us were there. I mean, it was one of the funnest moments it, of my it life. It was you know? literally stupid fun. It should have been criminal, if I'm being honest. You shouldn't be allowed to have that much fun with your close friends and make money at the same time. Well, yeah. all of you guys know that I already told you that I had kind of written myself out of this season by suggesting that I hook up with the next door neighbor. And so you guys were down there and I was getting like updates and looking on your Facebook pages because I wasn't down there with you guys. I was in LA waiting for Billy Riggins' storyline to come back at some point in time. What happens basically is that Tim Riggins goes and moves in with Joey. Yep. Well, he Guy lives Rastam. with me first and that's then right, Joey right. and then that's Coach, right. I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Boy. But that was, I mean, it was a really fun time. And I mean, I think everyone who loves Friday Night Lights loves Connie Britton and rightly so. Yeah. Her character is incredible and she's so much fun to work with. I think Connie is a kaleidoscope actor. And by that, I mean, because I'm a super nerd on the extra DVD for Lord of the Rings, Ian McKellen talks about how different he and Ian Holmes are. That Ian McKellen comes in and does the exact same thing every time. And Ian Holm comes in and kind of gives you a kaleidoscope of choices that you can then edit and sort of craft the scene any way you want. And I think Connie is really a kaleidoscope because she comes in and she gives you something different every time. And all of it is just grounded and beautiful and powerful and expertly done. You couldn't ask for a better scene partner. I love that you quoted Ian Holm from Lord of the Rings because there was a point in time when Steve and I were so broke when we were living together that we didn't <laughs> have cable. All we had was basically a box set of Lord of the Rings that somebody's <laughs> parents had gotten them for Christmas or something. And it was like an 80 five hours of Lord of the Rings behind the scenes. And Steve and I watched that thing on repeat. Oh, for years, I think. <laughs> That's all that we had. Sounds it was awful. literally the only entertainment we had in the house. And then you got an old school Nintendo. I do remember that. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think there was also Chinese food and alcohol, but yes. Also, you guys, their place smelled like boy. It yes. did. It did. Yes. In lieu of all that, do you have any fun behind the scenes stories that don't involve squirting water hoses? I think that's probably my best behind the scenes story. I have a really yeah. great fan interaction story. Derek, you were there. You may remember this. Glenn Reed is not the most beloved character from the Friday Night Lights universe. I think it's fair to say that. And I know this because fans often come up to me on the streets and tell me how much they hate my character because of... <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I'll say this about that. I mean, like, I get it. And it's interesting because I never thought that they would go there. I never thought they would have Glenn get drunk and kiss her because in the mm -hmm. first episode that I ever got, in the action lines, you almost never see this in a screenplay, right? You see it in a play all the time. It's like script notes, like note from the playwright. You'll see that in a play all the time. But in a screenplay or a teleplay, like you really just see the action that your character takes and the lines that they say. There's not a lot of pontificating going on about who the character <laughs> is or how they feel, right? Yeah. But there was this script note that was like, Glenn loves Tammy, but he will never... I but, know yep, that. But, and it says, it says, but he will never act on it. He will never do anything inappropriate with her because he has too much respect for her and he's too good of a guy. So I was playing that from the beginning that I was like in love with her, but that I was too nervous to ever say anything about it. I was, I mean, that was underneath all that weird awkwardness that I was doing. I never thought it would go to where it ultimately goes to, but I do get why the fans feel the way that they feel about me. But oftentimes people are diehard Glenn fans. This also happens. One time, Derek and I are driving down, I think it was like Beverly in LA and we pulled up to a stoplight and a car pulled up next to us. And like, I look over and there's these like two young women in the car and they're like, eyes are just lit up. They're like going crazy. And they're like, asking me to roll the window down. And I'm in Derek's passenger seat. And they can't see Derek because I'm like, a freaking giant and I'm blocking their view from anything else. <laughs> when I roll the window down and they're like, oh my God, I'm sorry to bother you. Do, you. do you play Glenn Reed on Friday Night Lights? And I'm like, oh yeah, I do. They're like, oh my God. They're like, we are the biggest fans of that show and we love your character. It was so much fun. And I was like, well, let me tell you something. I said to these ladies, I was like, if you're excited right now, then I'm about to make your night. And I literally just leaned back. Derek had a BMW that had like one of those automatic seat lean backs at the time. <laughs> and so 
I just like pressed the little button and it was like, <laughs> and then Billy Riggins was there and they just about lost their minds. And then Derek, do you remember what you said? Cause we were on our way. I have no clue. I hope it wasn't idiotic. No, no, it was great. We were on our way to meet Stacy and Annie. And so you were like, we're actually going to meet the Colette sisters right now. And then <laughs> oh they, they, they literally screamed out loud. And it was just one of those things. First of all, that kind of thing never happens in LA. I mean, LA people are so chill about business. Yeah. Like they never yeah. come up to you, even if they are your biggest fans. So it was just cool that that happened. Yeah. I do remember that. I remember we were over by Taroni. On yep. Beverly. Yeah. 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 Right by Taroni. That's right where it was. I know that's not behind the scenes, but that memory always it sticks out. It is behind to the, no, scenes. Behind what, the scenes. Really fast. Yeah. One time I was out with Derek and somebody was fawning over the show. We love Billy Riggins. Billy Riggins, our favorite character. We've seen every episode. And Derek was like, I mean, you're about to get really excited. Have you guys met my wife? And they turned to me and they were like, oh my God, what's it like to be married to the real Billy Riggins? And I'm like, nope, I'm on the show. <laughs> they just thought you were his actual wife. Yeah. Like I was married to Derek. <laughs> There's a lot of people who think you are my actual wife, though, Stacey. We might as well be. Well, that doesn't surprise me. How would you say that FNL affected everything going forward? I mean, I think like a lot of people, it changed the trajectory of my career. I mean, for one thing, I was very deeply entrenched in Second Thought Theater at the time that I got cast on the show. And so it disrupted that. Not necessarily even because like, kind of like what Derek said, it's not necessarily that I wanted it to, just did by its nature, because I knew I was going to be gone for like two months. And at that time, Second Thought was a scrappy young company. And it re really relied on us as individuals to get our hands dirty, to keep it going. And so just the fact that I wasn't going to physically be in Dallas for probably two months made it impossible for me to like commit to that particular season. That kind of gave me an opportunity to reevaluate what I wanted to do and, you know, to like kind of take stock in where I was and where I was going. And so I think if anything, it's, it's strange, but FNL kind of put the trajectory of my life on pause for a moment and gave me time to think about what I really wanted. And what I really wanted, it took me a little while to get there, but was to be a writer. That's what I had always wanted to be. It was my entry point into the business. It's why I became a theater major in a roundabout way. And so that allowed me to focus my energies and kind of reattack my career from a different angle. And look, that is essentially what you're doing. You know, I'm behind you 100% with your writing career. I love your writing, but I will still fight tooth and nail to get you on stage. You guys, one of my favorite performances I've ever seen on stage was Stephen Walters play Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet. I think about it all the time. So like, I don't want it to be done that I won't ever see you on stage, even though I came and saw you this summer. In you did, town. you did. But I have a really, I think for the first time in my life, a healthy relationship with acting. It's a part of who I am. I'll always be an actor. I love it as much as I've ever loved anything in my life. It's just not my career. And that's weird. It's a weird thing to say, but like I did a play this past summer. I went up to the Peterborough Players in Peterborough, New Hampshire, and I did Our Town in Our Town. You know, Peterborough actually is mm -hmm. Our Town, or at least they argue that it is. And that was just such a joyful experience because it was just about the story. And it was just about my love of live performance performance and my love of the craft. And it was really special that Stacey, that you came. It was just great. So I don't think acting will ever go away. And I can actually see a world where it could become central to my career again. It's just at the moment entrenched in writing and producing that there's not a lot of space for it. It's tough. I wish I could be an expert at all trades, but I can't. And, you know, I kind of have to go all in on the writing and producing thing at the moment. Well, I'm with Stacey. I want to see you act again, but I also love your writing, dude. You know that. Steve and I lived together for years. And so anytime Steve would write anything, he'd be like, dude, 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 come here, come here, come here. Check this out. Check this out. Come on, read this scene with me, bro. Read this, read this scene with me, bro. Oh my God, leave me alone! <laughs> I miss it from time to time. And it, always, always when I see my friends doing it or when I see a play, it always makes me miss it. But I think I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I think you're where you're supposed to be. What would you like people to know that you're working on the podcast? Where can people check you out? My favorite thing that I'm working on right now is season three of 1865. This is sort of like a spoiler, like there's going to be a third season. I don't know if anybody who listens to Clear Eyes actually listens to 1865. But if you don't, go listen to it. Go to your podcast app wherever you're listening right now and type in 1865. It's an audio drama told in a serialized format that starts the moment that Lincoln is assassinated in April of 1865. And it goes all the way through the Reconstruction era. Season one focuses on Lincoln's war secretary, Edwin Stanton, and his ongoing battle with Vice President Andrew Johnson, who's obviously Lincoln's successor. Season two focuses on the rise of General Grant and his war against the KKK. And season three is about a little known 
known forgotten American hero named John Mercer Langston about his rise to become the first black congressman in the state of Virginia, played expertly by our good friend, William Jackson Harper. And interesting, you know, it's funny, Stacey, my best memory of Will as an actor is seeing him play Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet. And actually, I played Mercutio after I saw Will play it, and I probably stole everything good that I did from Will. I mean, he's truly, I mean, for those of you who are not familiar with Will's work, he is one of the best actors working in the business. And Oh, absolutely. I saw him in Drawer Boy on stage, and I could, like, oh, you can't take your eyes off of him. He's incredible. He's magnetic. He's bold and fearless and just incredible. He plays John Mercer Langston in the upcoming third season and has been in the show for the first two seasons. He's been a big champion of that project. I think we're going to write the pilot of the third season together, or the first episode of the third Please season. Please do. I'm excited. I mean, there's some potential that there could be a second life for 1865 Beyond Podcast in another medium, but it's probably too premature to say anything about that. Thanks for this. And thanks for, Steve hates it when I call him this, but thanks for being a good boss. I really do hate that, but thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to thank y'all for doing this. You know, for me, when Chris and Mandy Wimmer at Black Barrel, you know, our producing partners on this, first came to me with this idea. They came to me and they said, hey, what do you think about doing a Friday Night Lights rewatch? My actual response was, what's a rewatch? Because I was not one of these West Wing Weekly people. I mean, I'm an executive in the podcast industry, but I don't work in that space at all. I don't work in entertainment. You know, I work in history and science and the curiosity space. That's what Lindsey Graham, my boss at Airship and I primarily do. So it just wasn't something that was in my wheelhouse. And so I went, I listened to West Wing Weekly and I was like, this is amazing. It's such a love letter to the fans. And so the two of you are the first people I reached out to because I was like, if I'm going to do this, I want to do it with my friends. And I think that what y'all have done is really special. And I think that you both have done such a great job. And I know for the fans of the show who I know who listen to you, they love what you're doing. And it's a pleasure for me to listen to it every week as well. So I just want to say thank you to both of you on behalf of the fans. It's really special what y'all are doing. Well, thank you. Thank you, buddy. Thank yeah. you for coming on. You didn't really have a choice. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate you having me on, guys. I'll see y'all soon. Guys, that is it for season two, episode two. But join us next time for episode three. Until then, clear eyes. Full hearts. Can't lose. Clear Eyes, Full Hearts is a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. Executive producers are Stacey Oristano and Derek Phillips, Chris and Mandy Wimmer for Black Barrel Media, and Steve Walters for Ritual Productions. Our producer is Miranda Parham. Send your questions to clearEyesFullHeartsPod at gmail.com. Find us on social media. I'm Stacey Oristano on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Derek Phillips on Twitter and underscore Derek Phillips on Instagram. And check out our websites, clearEyesFullHeartsPod.com, Cadence13.com, and BlackBarrelMedia.com. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next week.